I think most school board candidates, though, once they get there, will pound their head against the table and realize the whole system is rigged. Maybe you can stop a drag queen story hour in your school, but you're not gonna overturn the curriculum, which already has Howard Zinn embedded in it. And so the kids are learning that Ronald Reagan was the most evil person to, to, to exist in America and Barack Obama finally made us great. Welcome back to The Kevin Roberts Show. It's always a treat to think about who we're going to have as a guest. And you know that over the last 12 or 13 months, we've had policymakers, we've had people who are in elected office, book authors. We get someone who is unique. He's someone who's a combat veteran. You see him on TV. He's co-host of Fox and Friends Weekend, also host of a lot of Fox Nation documentaries, New York Times bestselling author, combat veteran, and I know what he would say is most important, is dad to seven children. And so it is a great pleasure to welcome the friend of the Heritage Foundation, Pete Hexeth. Hey, Kevin. Thanks for having me. Thanks for making time. It's great to be here. You know, here you are, big media star. No. But I also know, because we met several years ago in Austin and, and just had a few minutes together, you're just a regular guy. And that's a compliment. Well, I appreciate it. I, I'm in this not to be on TV. The, I'm an activist. I'm a patriot. I love this country. It's why you're involved with what you're involved in. And it does come back to the basics all the time. Like, what am I doing for my kids? What am I doing for my family? What am I doing for my country? And if we're blessed with a platform like Heritage or like Fox, what am I doing every waking moment to maximize the impact for the things that really matter? And then you know, at the end of the day, you know, drink a beer and watch some football. Man, we have really similar daily lives, <laughs> other than you're being on TV. No, really, th thanks for being here. And, and I know because as president of Heritage, I lead what's called America's Outpost for the Everyday American. Love that, by the way. It's it's really fitting. And, and not that we have any institutional hubris, quite the opposite. We have the humility that comes from recognizing that we have a moral obligation to represent the everyday American in the imperial city of D.C. And I know because I'm also a big consumer of Fox that you and a lot of your colleagues on Fox do an excellent job very genuinely doing the very same thing on TV. So on behalf of all of those hundreds of thousands of Americans who are supporters of Heritage, thanks. Well, I appreciate it. We work really hard to get out of the New York bubble too. Because, you know, that's – it's a lot of navel-gazing on the island of Manhattan, just like there is in Washington, D.C. I've D. seen C. that in D.C. too. All the time. So we're like, well, why are we covering this story? Most people don't live in New York and they might visit once or twice. Let's focus on the people that rarely get the spotlight and cover that. And I've had the good fortune of traveling around for Fox and Friends and doing the diner segments where you talk to regular – and the goodness and the graciousness, the gratitude of average people in America is – is amazing. It's inspiring. You see it too from the members that you have. So our job is actually easy. Just give voice to the things we know people believe in and have the courage to say it in DC or say it on TV. Because if we if we can't, then then they don't often have the kind of voice they deserve. And Lord knows the American Republic needs it. We're, we're going to talk about your book, which which I read just today, but I, I I read it cover to cover. It's more than the old graduate school skim. Oh, I've done that. But yeah, you you know that well. <laughs> but the 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 what that book speaks to is is this decay in the American Republic. And it's okay to be an optimist, but also recognize the reality of the situation. Before we get into the book, Pete, just give us your assessment as you travel to diners, you travel outside New York of the state of American culture. Well, I think it's really fragile and not heading in the right direction. Uh, and a lot of it does come back to our education system. If you're if you've removed God and you're teaching people the country they've inherited is evil and racist, uh, then what optimism can they have? What are they defending or fighting for? Uh, I, I still fall back on the fact, though, that it's always been the one, two, three, four percent of Americans who, who, who remind everybody else and motivate people to turn the ship around. We can do that. It, it's, you know, the 60s were a really bad cultural time, but we were still – in general agreement that America was good and talking about and, it, and, and worshiping God was good. And when you don't even agree on those basics, it's really hard to see the path forward without one side burning the other side down. And I, it's probably the easiest time ever to be a conservative because we're not defending marginal tax rates. We're, we're, what we're conserving at this point are the absolute basics, like 
Can a boy become a girl or a girl become a boy? Do we have borders? Are our police good? You know, should we allow God in the public square? Really easy, basic stuff to defend. If we can't defend that line, then we will lose our republic. I don't know what it looks like, uh, I, but I think about my kids, and I'm sure you do yours. I know they're entering into an environment in this country that will be at best rocky and at worst completely turbulent. And so that's why I've said – First thing I can do is is make sure they 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 know and love the Lord uh, as as the foundation of who they are in a rudderless world. And uh, you know I pray for our country and we keep swinging away because it's worth fighting for. But what the future looks like, I don't know. Well, it's undetermined. And, and as I tell my colleagues at, at Heritage every month when we have our all staff meeting, I'm not willing to be part of managing the decline of the American That's Republic. Right. And if in fact. In hindsight, 30, 50 years down the road, whenever the history of this era is written, the historians determine, you know what? That was one of the last chapters of the Republic. I at least want heritage and to know that that you live your life this way and so many of your colleagues at Fox do. We're going to go down swinging. Absolutely. And, and conversely, to, to be really optimistic about the future, that area of society that if we can fix – becomes the basis by which we can be optimistic Absolutely. is education, Absolutely. which is, I, I presume, why you wrote the book. And so I'm going to ask you momentarily to give us the rationale for that. But I would be remiss if, if we go any further without me thanking our friends at the Manhattan Institute for letting us sit here in New York. You know, there is friendly, very friendly competition among the think tanks. Mm -hmm. And for the everyday American, they couldn't care less about the competition among the think tanks. They just want the think tanks to put lead on the target. <laughs> but it's, it's, it's good for people to know that our friends at Manhattan said, sure, Kevin, you can come up to New York. It's easier for Pete. And we'll be recording a couple episodes here. So thank you, Manhattan, not only for that, but for the great work you do. Back to our story, Pete, and that's education. You've got a lot of things you could write books about. What was the inspiration for writing this book, Battle for the American Mind, about American schools? It may have seemed a little bit out of left field because I've written mostly about my military experiences, about politics. And I guess it came from how long can you beat your head against the wall about politics and then realize it's about much deeper things. And, you know, Andrew Breitbart famously said, politics is downstream of culture. And I was sitting in the 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 chairs of our church and my pastor of small Baptist church in New Jersey was giving a sermon and he said offhand in the sermon, yes, politics is downstream of culture, but culture is downstream of faith, of religion. And if you don't believe anything, that's the beginning of what you lose. And that became part of the rationale for the book is the recognition that we need to go deeper to the I won't use the word root causes because it's so poisoned at this point, but the 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 basis of who we are as a republic, as a people and what we're training our kids to do in the future. And that's when I, around about the same time I was introduced to uh, David Goodwin, my mm -hmm. co-author of the book, who this book is not possible without him and, and his association of classical Christian schools, indispensable. And my kids were involved in it, but I wasn't yet passionate about it. And then once you realize, wait, this is the education that I never got. I didn't realize when I went to the, you know, suburban, conservative, public school in Minnesota in the 1990s, I was getting a completely progressive education. And I didn't know it because everything had been buried underneath. So it felt like with David and I almost, especially him, and then I added on top of it, you feel like archaeologists. And I know you're well-versed in the area of classical education, having started a school, and, and, and you're ahead of the curve uh, way beyond me on this. But rediscovering the, the lost tools of learning, how our founders were educated, these brilliant 20-somethings that had a complete understanding of human nature uh, and of the history of governance and the limits, of how you limit government. That's where the brilliance came from was their understanding of history. And so once you see there's something out there that can be a part of that revival, it just kept pulling me and pulling me. And I remember thinking, walking into these classical schools saying, how do people not know about this? How did I not know about this? How is this a secret? And it wasn't a secret, but the goal of the book is, yes, we know uh, there's a problem, but the first step to recovery is understanding the depth of your problem. So there's a huge problem ID here to shake people and say, no, 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 no. It's your school too. You think you move to a good zip code. You think you, you know, you, you pay the property tax. You know the principal, he's a nice guy. No, no, no. There's a pipeline that's been established over 100 years to totally capture the minds of kids, including yours. And the lunacy's been on display since COVID because of what happened there, but it's always been there and we didn't know it. So it's half a confessional of my own life of, hey, this is what I failed at. And then a huge action portion to say, 
We argue for a radical reorientation of your life around your kids. I mean, your family and your faith is first. Uh, where you go to church is second. But then who do you hand your kids over to 40 hours a week? And it, it's meant to be a clarion call to arm parents to make that big leap to say, I'm pulling my kids out. They need to get out of the government schools. Um, so it, the first passion of mine was as a parent because I get I – get, it's cathartic to yell on TV or to, you know, <laughs> it's to do be. what we do or to go to me meetings and yell at senators. Like it's cathartic, but most it, it's insufficient. What we have to focus on first is the sphere that we can affect, which is our kids in their fragilest of years. And I, salt and light is a phrase I've used a lot. I'm sure you have as well, but you can't be salt and light if you don't have the foundation. And we're not giving that to our kids. I didn't get it and I didn't even know it. And I hope Uh, I pray that that my kids will get that and truly be salt and light in a culture that's going to be even more hostile to the things we used to believe. Well, I I appreciate that that inspirational summary summary, and I really do mean that. And and I'll just relate very briefly before reading one passage from the book that I found very moving that – 16 years ago, 17 years ago, when my wife and I were having our first informational meeting for the school, the classical school Mm -hmm. that we started in Louisiana. I got a taste of classical education because of the public school that I attended in Louisiana of all places. Mm -hmm. But it was sort of the last gasp of of that beautiful education in a government-funded school. But we had 120 parents there, prospective parents for this school that didn't even have a campus. It had all of its faculty hired, but we had no physical plan. Wow. Because this is in the in the months following the hurricanes of 2005 in Louisiana. And I remember the parents, the prospective parents saying, Kevin, look at this curriculum. Why didn't we get that? <laughs> yes. And that's when I realized, oh, my gosh, this isn't just about whomever is going to come here as students or as families. This is about a movement that we really have to revitalize. And I mean it when I say it because we simply wouldn't have someone on the show if we weren't willing as Heritage to endorse their book. Your book is something that everyone needs to read. So if someone in the audience is, is saying, I don't know about classical education, precisely, it's okay. Read it. And so I want to read a passage that hopefully will, will cause people to go buy this. I've got no dog in that fight other than the truth. <laughs> and so I, I just want to congratulate you and your co-author, David Goodwin, for a job well done. You 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 put your finger on something that is one of the origins of this problem, which is Marxism. Mm -hmm. And several times on this show, including uh, episodes around the time that we're recording this one, I always place the caveat. I don't use that as a a sort of empty, derisive term. I mean it as as an academic descriptive. A precise term. It's precise. So here's your precision. Today, these cultural Marxists, the direct descendants of economic Marxists, control every strong point, every choke point, and every inch of high ground in the realm of American education and, by extension, American culture. That was the plan, and it worked. Are there any corners in American education where the cultural Marxists have not extended their influence? Well, there are tiny corners. I mean, there are guys like Robbie George at Princeton who started the James Madison program when I was an undergraduate there. He's ne- there were no, no outed conservative professors. Now there are 25 and he's got a fl- – so if you can – there are outposts inside uh, the, the Marxist educational establishment. But otherwise, no. Uh, even most Christian schools. Even a lot of Catholic schools, even a lot of, uh, you know, most elite schools are actually the worst. And this idea, we've always believed, I, I, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but it's conservatives in local control of education. Sure. And, and parents make – the problem is, is that over time through the Federal Department of Education and other prerogatives out of Washington, D.C., the tentacles have moved all the way down to the point where the ability to control your school, school locally is almost impossible. You add the unions on top of it, the teachers' colleges, the testing. I mean, even even the test is now racist and has to be changed and and and, and tuned to Common Core, which was all a set of prerogatives, all dumbed down. And and what we try to do in the book is tell the story, not just say it's Marxists, but point out to the specific Marxists. And and when you meet the characters in this 100-year takeover, to a man and to a woman, they are almost all atheists, socialists, or Marxists. Of self-avowed. And it, it, when you look at the, the weave of history, we're talking about critical race theory. Well, it came from critical theory. Where did critical theory come from? From a bunch of Marxists fleeing Nazi Germany. And where did they land? At Columbia University's Teachers College in the 30s. And they were welcomed. 
and they were shocked that they were welcomed. But when they were, then they started pushing this new theory in the preeminent teachers college, which then those teachers went out and taught. And then the unionization mover, movement took over what had been formerly fairly conservative teachers associations. In fact, they used to hand out Bible pamphlets, the teachers unions, before they were unions. So That's really hard to believe, right? They did. It's hard to believe, but they did. So they all got captured slowly but surely. I can't remember the, the axiom completely. It's O'Sullivan's Law. I don't know if you've heard of it. I think he's a National Review writer. Any organization not decidedly that doesn't focus on it, having a decidedly conservative culture over time will become left wing. I can't think of an exception to that. I can't either, unless you are laser focused on preserving your culture as uh, as heritage is. And that's what happened in all of these other entities. And the story starts not with what they put in, which is now sheer indoctrination. It started with what they removed and they removed, it was God they knew they needed to remove because it was the immovable object to get rid of an understanding of human nature, an understanding of original sin, understanding of our limits as individuals, that we can't create utopia on earth because man is not perfectible. But if you remove that, then all the utopian schemes can make their way in. And of course, I mean, here we are today where, uh, what was it? My dad texted me a couple minutes ago, his alma mater, Hamlin University in Minnesota, just fired a professor because he showed one image of Muhammad uh, in an art class and told the students they didn't have to come in if they didn't want to, to, he was fired. But, you know, God, Christian God would never be allowed in, and if you could, you could put a painting of, you know, Jesus upside down and what, and you'd be fine. So we, the world you is upside down. You almost get tenure down. quicker. You might get tenure quicker <laughs> for that. Uh, so it is, it is a precise term. These are Marxists who remain on the march and they realize that economic Marxism wasn't our Achilles heel in America, that it was our history on race. And so they went in that direction uh, and have continued ever since. You use this, I think this is the very first chapter, the not COVID-19 lessons, but COVID-16-19 lessons. <laughs> I, I just think that's really clever. I, I'm not going to ask you if that's your idea or your co-authors, but it's, it's it really It was clever. one of the few that was mine. Oh, there you yes. go. Okay. <laughs> Tell us about it. Well, the whole idea that when COVID shut down classrooms and kids were learning at home through Zoom classrooms and laptops, it was right at the moment that the 1619 Project and it, it, Trump created – and I don't want to take it all back to Trump, but you talked about, um, you know, st having real fighters who are going to fight to – his willingness to fight cr created a reaction from the left where they basically exposed themselves out of the tall grass. Yes, we are socialists. Yes, we – so just at the moment, they felt confident and cocky enough to come out and say, yeah, 1619 should be our real founding date. And you know what? Your boy, if he, was, if he once wore a dress, we're going to turn him into a girl. All of these ideas are starting to come out. The laptops come into the home and parents are looking over their shoulder going, what is that? Because the stuff never made its way out of the classroom, except for maybe an offhand comment from the kids. And so there was this giant revelation amongst parents in America that the education system had gone sideways. It's because the unions and others were willing to expose themselves and the classroom was in the home. And it, I mean, you saw homeschooling numbers rocket and they're still going up, which is a beautiful, beautiful thing to say. There's a great classical conversations model. It's a that, tremendous program. Tremendous program that has, you know, hundreds of thousands of students in this country and is part of the what we call is the educational insurgency. There is an insurgency. This is the darkest moment almost, but it's also beginning to be the brightest because there's a renaissance coming. Uh, and that moment just made parents who were otherwise just not aware look up and go, hmm, something's a little off. And this, this book was actually, the concept was started before that. And then that happened and we thought, okay, this is an opportunity. I worked in the vet space forever. And when the Phoenix VA scandal happened, when they died, it's like, we knew those things were happening, but it took a moment to pique people's interest and wake them up and say, whoa, there's a real problem here, which created an opportunity for change. We're hoping that moment at Revelation is a part of parents' choosing to leave government schools. And we've seen it. Enrollment is down massively uh, across the country in public schools. And we hope that trend continues. Well, it's, it's an opportunity. I think it's one of the silver linings, ironically, yep. from the overwrought COVID shutdowns and how appropriate that in the United States, there would be a silver lining to all of that yeah. because of the freedom and self-governance we practice. But the point is that we have this opportunity. We have to be part of this insurgency to, to rebuild American institutions, whether it's homeschooling co-ops facilitated by one of the greatest homeschooling resources coming from this homeschool dad of 10 years, 
classical conversations. There are so many other resources there. But also, you think about what the public charter school movement has has meant for the rebirth of classical education. If you didn't have great heart schools emerging out of the, the school choice movements of Arizona 15 years ago, and embracing classical education, then then you you don't have the opportunity to scale it to the point that it is. You're a busy Absolutely. guy. No, it's yeah. Busy. It's, hey, that might be your wife. You might want to take it. It actually is. <laughs> I'm, I'll call her back. Don't worry. She's okay. Good. You, you got your priorities in order, which we know. You know, well, I should of, take it if I had my priorities in order, but well, I won't. It, it reminds me of sitting in mass one day uh, with a friend of mine. Uh, the, the priest was a friend of mine. We talked about classical education. And in the middle of mass, his phone rang. He looked at it. He said he was from Vietnam. When your mother calls from Vietnam, answer it. So you can decide <laughs> if we're good to continue. We're good to continue. Yeah, okay. Yeah, we're good. With, with, kids at, with kids at home. Yes. I know how that goes. There's a great contrast in your book. In fact, I'm looking at this chart in in the chapter, The Forgotten Force of Western Christian Education. And it's, it's very helpful. I'm just going to mention a couple of these for the sake of the audience, Pete. The contrast between classical education and the modern education system. Mm-hmm. It's good to search for a job. But if, for education to lead to that, but if that's the ultimate aim and the only aim of education, then it, it reduces us to just cogs in the wheel, to, which is to what they want, by the way. Which that is, is what exactly Dewey and right. others wanted. And and the contrast is from classical education, a lifelong search for greater meaning in life. Have you seen that as you have traveled the country? That is the better of those two, or in the cases of your own family? Oh my goodness, yes. I mean. You said it up front, and it's true. When when you're introduced to classical Christian education, the first thing you say is, "Can I go back to school? I wish I could." And it is a our school does it this way. It's continuing education for parents. Parents come in three, four times a year uh, to be a part of lectures, to be exposed to the classical Christian education their kids are getting that they never got, because you because when you strip God God out and you strip classics out and you strip Latin and Greek out and you strip real history out and turn it into a sort of whitewashed textbook version where you're not telling, you're not reading original sources and you're not dealing with big narratives, then it's not interesting. And and you get a very superficial view of human nature in the world. And so it is it is the ability to grapple with big questions at an age that's appropriate, but at an age where they're capable. And so they're treated like they're not capable. And and, and without God, I mean Without God in the, in the classroom, you can't ask the bigger questions. You know, why are we here? What is it all about? What is goodness and truth? The types of things that were the baseline. What is wisdom? What is justice? Well, now justice is just, you know, social justice or grievance justice. I mean, so they've replaced it with a different form of religion, which in the, in, in that example, we, we, we contrast today, which we call the culturally Marxist paideia, with the originally, which is the Western Christian paideia. And paideia is a lost Greek word about how we educate our youngest, effectively. There's no translation in English, but our founders understood the word very well. It's the waters in which our children swim and how they learn. And how they come to live the good life, right? How they, are eloquent about the that. The vision of the good life is what it is. And education was a part of developing that. Whether you were going to be a philosopher or a welder, it doesn't, doesn't matter. Uh, having the baseline of free thinking and understanding beauty. I mean, classical Christian schools do art beautifully and intentionally, and you know this. I never thought of art as a learned skill. Which it, you thought, oh, he's either good at art or he's bad at art, and that's just the way it is. No, it's a reflection of God's beauty and his creation, uh, the way we try to make beautiful things. You go into a classical school, you will see artwork from 12th graders, boys and girls, that is as good as anything you'll see hanging anywhere else because they put intentionality into doing something and making something beautiful. I tell my kids every day before school, slow down, because kids, they rush. Slow down and make beautiful things do things well. That's and, really good advice. And that's part of what, it comes back on the report cards that they need to slow down. So that's part of the advice. <laughs> is this uh, perhaps hereditary from dad? Perhaps, okay, perhaps, yes. But it is, I mean, that's partly what classical Christian slow down a little bit. Don't rush at the most modern teaching technique, which somebody tells you that comes with a, you know, uh, some software with it and a new device. Slow down and remember, we're a small part of human history and we should draw and learn from it and gain wisdom from the past and then understand our place in the future. And that's what I, we're moving fast enough as a culture. Get fortified before you rush into it. It's really the antidote. Yes. To all of that, especially if if the basis of it is, is Christianity. 
I'll mention two stories that that are are intended to encourage people listening, presumably adults who say, you know, it's too late for me to get into classical education. Well, after I started this this K through twelve classical school, I found myself short a faculty member, and so I had to pick up the poetry class. Poetry is very important. Yes. For classical schools because it teaches memorization, which you know is a four-letter word to public schools. Yep. It was very important. It's, that's how kids can achieve things academically in the first, second, third grade. So I would go in and I would, I would teach these kindergartners, first graders, second graders, poetry like 15 minutes uh, uh, at a time. I, the point is I didn't come to love poetry until I did that hmm. because I was slowing down to be able to teach these people who were much younger than me. And I realized all the times I'd been assigned poetry and grumbled about it because of my own limitations and immaturity, I wasn't slowing down. But when you do that, you really embrace it. And then the, the, the second thing is I didn't appreciate beautiful art until I was president of Wyoming Catholic College, which is famous – for, among other things, embracing that Western tradition of art, you know, across the Judeo-Christian mm -hmm. tradition. Until I sat in on a class taught really, really well by one of the faculty members, I didn't appreciate it. And I walked away thinking, there's not enough time in one life to drink fully from the cup that is classical education. And it sounds like you've had that. Obviously, you've had that experience because you were inspired to write the book. But, it's, but I love what you said. It's not too late for anybody. And we intentionally in the book write parents and grandparents because if your kids are up and gone and you didn't know about it and you got a couple libs in the family now because you let them get a hold of them, you got grandkids, you got others, you can get – how how had you ever started a school before? I'm sure you hadn't. Never thought I would. You, you figured it out, invested the time, and now how many hundreds or thousands of kids and families have been affected – by the opportunity they had that they otherwise would not have had. And that's what got me so inspired in the book is that the insurgency has begun. I mean, at the darkest moment of education in America, I think, was probably the 1970s. They'd almost outlawed homeschooling. There were zero classical Christian schools in America. And some parents got together, rediscovered classical Christian and started a network. And today they're, I don't even know what the number is, but if you talk to David, they're bursting with interest. They can't keep up. They can't keep up. And if you get laws like they have in Arizona and more school choice in places like Florida where the dollars really follow the kids, then you have a chance to really scale this thing that, in a way that American kids deserve. Every fastest growing segment of American education has to do at least indirectly with classical education. So classical Christian schools are one of them homeschooling, and then also hybrid schools, which yep. I, I think – I mean this was happening before COVID, but COVID I think has, has caused the number of those to increase by six or seven times. So two days a week, virtual, three days or two days in, in, in class with a teacher. The point is that America should be leading the way when it comes to innovation and we have to take the shackles off. That would be good in and of itself if that's what happened because mm -hmm. of school choice. But it's the second part that's really crucial. If you take the shackles off and all you're doing is replacing it with the nothingness yes. on the best day that is what's taught in every college of education. That's not hyperbole. Every yeah. college of education. Rather than the truth that comes from classical education, we're missing the opportunity. A hundred percent right. That's why reforming the system is – no. I mean, we, we, it's over. We've, we lost. The system is gone. So we have to – we call it a tactical retreat. We put it in military terms. Like the, we lost the battle here. Uh, let's retreat, regroup, and f the, the, the preferred form of warfare of the weak against the strong is insurgency. And that's what I taught in Afghanistan. I was a counterinsurgency instructor. So my job was to understand the Taliban and the Islamist insurgency. So – and then you pull on a little bit of Mao who originally wrote about the phases of insurgency. And you realize, OK, we're in about mid phase one of an insurgency, building networks, uh, creating a foundation, still a little bit underground. Uh, but that includes building a totally separate ecosystem. We have to build those teachers' colleges uh, and pump out teachers prepared to teach classical Christian education, which every school has a challenge with finding teachers that have to be basically deprogrammed into a totally different way of educating. But once 
if they have the basics of their skill set, it's not tough to pick up once you realize, okay, this is how kids actually learn. They learn from memorizing. Then they learn how to think logically. Then rhetoric, how do I express my ideas in a, in a, in a those are the three, you know, sort of, we call it elementary school, middle school, and high school. That's not what they used to call it. Uh, I know you probably call it grammar, logic, and rhetoric. You got it. Those are the, the three phases of, of how kids learn. We have to recreate everything on our own. And then through doing that, create the opportunity for kids who are stuck in failing schools and parents who don't even know what they're missing. Because uh, they don't. That's what I was embarrassed as someone who'd always been interested in education when I started this project of how little I knew. And not that I think highly of myself, but if I didn't know this stuff – and I, you know, went to Princeton and went to Harvard. I sent my degree back to Harvard, though. I'm, I'm quite happy about that. Uh, did you get a return? No, I did. I, did <laughs> you reply? see that? By chance? I, it was on Fox and Friends. I pulled my Harvard degree out of the frame and I wrote return to sender on it. And I crossed out Harvard University. I wrote critical theory university on the top. I folded it up and they have not uh, that's gotten a, back to me That's a that bold yet. move. I love it. But, it. but it was a bold move not meant to be a stunt right. to say, let's stop holding these places up as imprimaturs of credibility. They're poisoning our country. They're bad for our republic. We should scorn them at every turn and not hang their degrees up as like, well, I got mine, but now I don't like them. No, you can have it. I don't want it and I don't want my kids to go there and your money shouldn't go there because you're funding the enemy every time you do. And we all have alma maters we like. We like the football team or whatever. Guilty as charged. Guilty as charged. <clears throat> Give to the ROTC program or the conservative publication or the football team, if you want, but don't give to the university. Stop. They have enough money to begin with. They got plenty of money and all they're going to do is use it to indoctrinate the kids. Find a classical Christian school or find a homeschool network or find someone you can sponsor. Give your money there that actually reflects your values. You're, it's okay to switch your allegiance. Like if your team is on the wrong side, pick a different team and get behind them all the way. And that's hard for people to make that mental shift. But sending my degree back was, was, was part of me saying this is what we all have to do in our own ways if we can. Well, two things. The first is we, some of my heritage colleagues, against their better judgment, listen to this show or watch it. <laughs> They're not required to. They, yeah, they, I was going to say, they, is they, it they, they, they will to this episode because you're the guest. But that will sound very familiar to them, what you just said compared to what I say often, almost every month, which is we're in the second American revolution. Hopefully no more bloodshed than what the, the, the violent rioters and Black Lives Matter caused two and a half years ago. But rather what I mean by that, and, and our mutual friend Robbie George talks about this, um, is that the most important part of the American revolution and insurgency yes. wasn't just the heroism on the battlefield, the sacrifices at home with, with men gone, but in fact, what happened in the years following, which was the rebuilding of American institutions to reflect American, not British values. Mm -hmm. Now, the disparity between American and British values in the late 18th century was minuscule compared to the disparity in values between classical education and the, the system we've been under. But the point is the same, that we have to end our fealty to our alma maters if they're even 10 percent off from our worldview. It goes back to John O'Sullivan's law yeah. because they are going to go off the deep end. And so we always on this show like to talk about action steps. And it sounds, if I can intuit from what you're saying, Pete, that one of the action steps you're saying is it doesn't matter who you are, what your background is, whether you've had one day of classical education, if you find this book or this conversation inspiring, go do something about it. Absolutely right. Every classical school needs someone to help out. You know, everyone's got – they're there's – and it – because traditionally we looked for traditional political routes to go. OK, vote somebody else in or, uh, you know, run for – even run for school board, which I – I hope people do and we should do. Ron DeSantis is doing a great job down in Florida recruiting school board. That is really, really important. I think most school board candidates though once they get there will pound their head against the table and realize – the whole system is rigged. Maybe you can stop a drag queen story hour in your school, but you're not going to overturn the curriculum, which already has Howard Zinn embedded in it. And so the kids are learning that, uh, you know, Ronald Reagan was the most evil person to, to, to exist in America and Barack Obama finally made us great. I mean, that, that's what they're already reading. And you're probably not going to be able to get rid of that. And, and what we say in the book is, you know, because we were all heartened by watching people protest at school board meetings. There was those big protests, you know, we, we say it's like charging a fortified machine gun nest with Nerf guns. We salute your efforts, but you're all going to die. 
Uh, and that good for you for protesting, but you have to take a dramatic action step that actually saves your kids. It's not enough to hope for a a new public policy that allows. What about your kids and your neighbors right now who are awash in TikTok and gender theories and social pressure? And if they're not equipped, they will cave to it. There's just no there's there's no reason for them to do otherwise if they want to get along with their lives. And we don't win with survivors. Yeah, we have we three win generations. With warriors. Exactly. We have three generations that that prove that, right? Correct. That, that you just have to have a warrior mentality. I'm gonna read one more short passage from the book to convince people they really need to go buy it. And then we probably will have to talk about why you're optimistic in spite of all of the problems. If we hope to defeat America's longtime progressive opponents, we must fight back, not just harder but wiser. We need to prepare children who, with an independence of mind, still revere divine order lest they succumb to anarchy, the point you're just making. We need to train children to apply reason to find truth sourced in God, not in themselves, and to reject indoctrination. If we do this, the young will find higher meaning and a higher purpose. Their job will be but a part of who they are, not a life-defining purpose. And as you sum up here, we will return to an America recognized for its strong-spirited citizens who live in community rather than eventually dying as weak servants of the state. Hmm. Well said. That, to me, encapsulates everything we're up against right now. That's why you exist. That's why I'm involved in what I'm involved in is – it will be our youngest. And that's what's part of aging, right? You realize like, I'm not leaving anything on this earth. The only thing I'm leaving are those souls behind me. And the only thing they'll leave is their kids and grandkids. And if I don't impart, and that's why I get so, I feel for so many parents that say, I just didn't know. And I didn't know. And my kids went off to college and now they're all lefties. And now they're all, you know, they're, they think the earth's going to die in five years and they don't want to have kids. And, you know, everything is about social justice. And I've, I'm, I'm not bemoaning those people or criticizing them, but you lost the most important part of your legacy. That's right. You did. And so do your best to try to recapture it and certainly prevent it for future generations. And that could happen to me. It could happen to you. I mean, you, you got kids that have their own minds and make them. But Free I'm gonna, will is a powerful thing. 100%. <laughs> but I'm going to expose them to timeless wisdom. And biblical truth, not just on Sunday morning and Wednesday night, which the progressives mocked. Uh, if you read their writings, what what chance do the theists have with their Wednesday night and Sunday morning when we have forty hours of secular education? They mocked it. They knew it was utterly insane, and that's what I got. I had Sunday morning and Wednesday night, and so when I came out of high school, I had a. Uh, Christian veneer, but a secular core. And I didn't know how deep that ran in me. If we want a free country, we need people who who the, know what they believe and why, have the courage of their convictions, uh, and don't think they are the savior of the world. There's one savior. You, you exist to serve him and everything else on here. Let's make lives better for people. That's a good thing, but it certainly doesn't come from government. Uh, so it's Role, this whole book is about coming back to first principles, retreating, and it stands on top of a lot of other great work that people have done. This is a, a, a ring the alarm bell uh, for people to to save their kids and well, the that's, country. That's the beauty of the book, by the way, is is that it, it it does stand on the shoulders of a lot of important authors and books that have come before it. It, but it advances the ball, dare I say, because it's really focused on and on why and how we do what we do to save America by being focused on classical education. So I, I really do mean it. I would not say it I otherwise. It. Job well done. So I'm not going to ask you about a full definition of trivium and quadrivium <laughs> because in the interest of time- You call David time, Goodwin for that. Yeah, that's right. And we'll have, we'll have David on the show too because I've not met him yet. He sounds you like a bright him. guy. Awesome. And a great American patriot, one of the luminaries of education of our age. But we do have time for one last question that I, I do try to ask each guest, Pete. And it is- in spite of all the, the candor that we had in our conversation today, in spite of all of the reasons to perhaps be on the brink of despair in the fights ahead, why did you wake up optimistic about the American future today? <laughs> that presupposes I woke up optimistic about the American future. I was future. presupposing that. I, I took that presumption. Uh, you did. Because truth is truth. Uh, and if we have the courage of our convictions – I, I was once in a Bible study randomly 
with John Ashcroft when he was the attorney general. Great it was guy. a long time ago, yeah. and he would have interns. And I was at the uh, Family Research Council for a, for a summer internship, their Witherspoon Fellowship. And now they're trying to tear the Witherspoon statue down in Princeton, by the way. Um, and he, he said a simple prayer. He said, uh, give me the wisdom to see what is right and the courage to do it. That was the simple, the wisdom to see what is right and the courage to do it. And I think it comes down to that. We need to be willing to seek the wisdom, which is an ongoing lifelong process. Man, I was a fool. I still am uh, in so many chapters and aspects of my life. And I'm humble enough to know that. And God gives you those chapters to, to give you an opportunity uh, to make it right. Uh, wisdom is something we all pursue. But truth is out there. If we expose our kids to it, um, God is divine and ultimately and sovereign. Ultimately, I believe uh, that truth will win out. And it starts in our homes and it starts in our churches and it starts in our classrooms. And knowing that we have that light starting to burst out uh, educationally and culturally, even as things get darker and darker, those brighter moments have to shine brighter. And sometimes you need those crucibles to come out the other side uh, and, and make a run back at them. And I, I hope we're part of that refortification so that our kids and grandkids can make a run back at this republic. So that I don't feel very optimistic about like this week or next month, but I believe the insurgency has begun. And, and that's a good sign for this republic that, you know, I want for 250 more years. Yeah. So let's at least light a candle and not just curse the darkness. Yes. Amen. Pete Hegseth. Thanks for joining me. Most importantly, thanks for everything you've done for this re republic, for, from all of us at Heritage. We're really grateful. Well, likewise. Appreciate the work you God guys bless do. You, my friend. Man the outpost. Guns out. Every day, brother. <laughs> Hope you enjoy that conversation as much as I did. Hopefully, we'll have Pete back. Obviously, he's going to write another book. I have an idea what it might be about. You'll want to take a look at that. But most importantly, buy Battle for the American Mind. If you have not yet rated this show and you like this episode, give us a five-star rating. We're grateful. Most of all, we'll see you next time. God bless you. God bless America. Mm -hmm.